In this vocabulary masterclass, you're going to learn 300 words that you can use in your daily speech. Using these 300 words in your daily speech will help you sound fluent just like a native speaker. Welcome back to J4's English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. I'm sure you're learning English because you want to travel the world. You want to interact with people from around the world. So first you're going to learn 50 essential travel phrases that you can use anytime you travel. So your bags are packed and you're ready to visit North America. Let's talk about all the phrases that you need, starting with greetings. Now, as a tourist, you're going to be using these greetings when you go to stores, restaurants, or interact with service providers, like when you rent a car or book a tour. You can simply say, hello, because for more impersonal interactions, when you don't know the person socially, we just say hello. That's the standard greeting in these situations. You could also say hi there. So add there, hi there, hi there. When you go into a restaurant, a store, hi there. Of course you wouldn't wave. <laughs> I'm just doing that. I guess you could. Hi there. Hello. Now time specific, you could say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Don't say good night because that's what we use before you go to sleep. So after 4 to 6 p.m., you can say good evening. Now only for morning, native speakers, we drop the good and we just say morning, morning, but we don't say afternoon. You always say good afternoon, good evening, but you can simply say morning, morning. Now after your greeting, you can state your reason for your visit. So if you're at a restaurant, you can say, hi there, we have a reservation under forest. Usually the reservations are made under your last name for 7 p.m. You could include the time, but you don't need to because the reservation will have the time. Or you could approach a booth and say, good morning, could you please tell me when the next ferry to Staten Island comes? Notice how I use could you please? That's to sound more polite. Now don't worry about taking notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. You can look in the description for the link. How about this one? Excuse me, do you carry sunscreen? Do you carry? You're asking the store if they have. Do you carry sunscreen? Now notice, excuse me, this isn't necessarily a greeting, but it's what we use to get someone's attention. So if the store person is stocking a shelf, you can say, excuse me, and then they will stop what they're doing and look at you. So it's used to get attention. Now, technically you can say, pardon me, pardon me, do you carry sunscreen? But pardon me isn't very common in North America in this context. In North America, we use pardon me if we don't understand something. So if someone's talking to me and maybe there's a lot of background noise, I may say, pardon me to ask them to repeat themselves, but we don't really use it to get someone's attention. So just use excuse me to get someone's attention. Now let's review all the phrases you need if you don't understand someone or if you don't hear them because there's a lot of background noise or maybe they just spoke very quietly. Like I said, pardon me. Pardon me. Now you can also say, excuse me, but it's more in a questioning tone. Excuse me. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Now you can always say, sorry, English isn't my first language. So you're giving them the information they need to know so they can adjust. Because if you tell a native speaker, oh, sorry, English isn't my first language, they'll naturally just try to speak slower or louder or in a different way to help you understand. And don't be afraid to say, can you repeat that slower, please? The person will not be offended or upset 
if you say that. So don't be afraid to use it. Or you can say, sorry, I'm not sure what m means. That means, or if you know the specific word, you can say, I'm not sure what a transfer means. Can you explain it a different way? Can you give me more information? Can you help me understand? Or simply you can say, sorry, I don't understand. English isn't my first language. And they will naturally know they need to speak slower, louder, or explain it a different way. Can you repeat that, please? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. As a tourist, you're going to be spending money at stores. So let's talk about the phrases you need. When you go into a store or when you take all of your items to checkout when you're ready to pay, you can just say, hi there, or any of the other greetings. Now, previously, the stores would ask you cash or credit, but this isn't common in North America today. It's assumed you're going to pay with a credit card. So they generally don't ask you about the payment method. They will probably just point at the machine and then you can tap your card. Cash or credit. Now there are some street vendors. A street vendor would be a small shop or something that isn't a physical store. It is possible that they only accept cash, but this is becoming less and less common. Basically, everywhere you go in North America, you can pay with your card, even the smallest street vendors, because they have a little device they put on their phones and then their phone turns into a payment processor and you just tap your card on the phone. So even at very small vendors, you can likely pay with your card, but of course bring a little cash with you. You can ask how much is this for one item? How much are these for two or more items? Now, after you pay, they might ask you, do you need a bag? Now they might say need a bag or simply bag with a rising intonation to show it's a question. Plastic bags are not used at most stores in North America. They are banned for environmental reasons. So if you need a bag, most likely you have to pay for that bag instead of plastic. Stores use paper bags and they're probably about 15 cents per bag. Or you can get a reusable bag depending on the quality, one to three dollars. A lot of smaller stores, convenience stores, markets, they still use plastic bags, but the bigger stores generally don't. But you can always ask them, can you give me a bag please? or I need to buy a bag. Now, sometimes I hear students say, please, I need to buy a bag. And they put please at the beginning of a statement, but that is not common in North America and it sounds a little awkward. So put please at the end. I need to buy a bag, please. Please commonly comes at the beginning when it's the imperative. So you're giving an instruction. Please put the receipt in the bag. Put the receipt in the bag is the instruction and you can add please at the beginning to sound more polite. You could also add it at the end. After you pay, they might say, do you need, want a receipt? Again, to try to be more environmental and save paper, they don't automatically print receipts. They might just say, need a receipt, want a receipt, or receipt. You can say, no, that's okay, no thanks, yes please. Now, right before you pay, they might say something really long that you don't understand. They may be asking you for a donation, which is very common. Do you want to donate $1 to the children's hospital? They might ask you if you have a points or rewards membership with that store, or they might ask you if you want to sign up for something like a Walmart MasterCard or a points card or a membership. If you don't understand, just say no thanks. No thanks, because they're probably just trying to give you something additional. 
Now, if you go into a clothing store or a larger store, they will greet you and they'll ask you if you're looking for something specific. You can say, I'm just looking. I'm just browsing, but in North America, looking is more common. I'm just looking, thanks. Uh, no thanks, I'm just browsing. Oh, I'm just looking, thanks. Or if you are looking for something specific, you can say, I'm looking for a small backpack. Where can I find men's socks? Do you carry sunglasses? If you're buying clothing, you can ask, where can I try this on? Where are the fitting rooms, the changing rooms, which is where you try things on. You can also ask them, what's your return policy to know if the item is returnable or exchangeable. Now let's talk about dining out at restaurants. When you go to a restaurant, you can use your greeting. Hello. Hi there. Good afternoon. Table for two, please. Or you can state, we have a reservation under, and then your name, generally just your last name under forest. Or maybe you want to make a reservation. Can we make a reservation? And they'll ask you when or what day, how many people and what time. Table for two, please. Now, if you're staying at the restaurant, you can ask them, do you have any tables outside? Do you have any tables on the patio? So they mean the same thing. The patio or outside is an area that is outside. So you have inside or outside. Outside is on the patio. And if you're inside and you see this really nice table by the window, you can say, can we sit by the window, please? Are there any booths available? So maybe they're putting you at a table with chairs, but you want to sit in a booth. Just ask them, are there any booths available? If you have any allergies, you can tell your server, I'm allergic to, I'm allergic to shellfish. Or maybe you see an item, a stir fry with chicken, and you want to know, can you make that vegetarian? Can you make that vegan? Can you make that gluten free? To order, just say, I'll have. I'll have the stir fry with shrimp, please. Alternatively, I'd like. I'd like the stir fry with shrimp, please, but I'll have is way more common. Now you may want to modify your order. I'll have the stir fry with shrimp, please, but no onions. Hold the onions without onions. They all mean the same thing. Can you add pickles? So if you want something additional, can you add pickles? Can you make it extra spicy? This is something my husband asks every time. Can you make it extra spicy? Can you put the sauce on the side? So maybe if they put a sauce over top, can you put it on the side? Sauce on the side again, please. Just know that modifying your orders is extremely common and accepted in North America. So don't be shy. If you want something specific, just ask, they will do it for you. And don't forget to ask for water because as a tourist, you need to drink a lot of water. Can you bring us some water, please? They might ask you sparkling or still bottled. Just say tap water. Tap water is fine. Sometimes the restaurants try to sound more fancy and say house water, but it's the water that comes out of the tap, which is drinkable in all of North America. So if you don't want to pay for water, just say tap water is fine and know that water is free everywhere you go in North America. You can go into any place and ask for water for free. You might ask them, where are the bathrooms or restrooms? Either word choice is fine. Where are the bathrooms? Where are the restrooms? Just don't say where are the toilets because we don't use that word for restaurants. Now, if you had a big meal and you didn't finish it all, you can say, can I have a to go box, please? And they'll bring you a box and you put your leftovers and then you take it with you. Can I have a to go box, please? Or you can say, can you wrap this up? So they will take your food, 
put it in a to-go box and bring it back to you. Can you wrap this up? Can you pack this up? They mean the same thing. If they try to offer you dessert or coffee and you don't want it, say just the check, please. You can say check or bill, just the check, please. Just the bill, please. Can you bring me the check or bill, please? Or you can simply ask, where do I pay? Just the check, please. Um, where do I pay? It's $25, right? In North America, tips, gratuity are rarely added to the bill automatically. So it's your choice to leave it when you pay. There'll be an option on the machine. It's not required, but it is highly expected. And a 10 to 20% tip, depending on the formality of the restaurant and the level of service is expected. But again, it isn't required. Now at any restaurant, cafe or store, you can ask them, do you have Wi-Fi? or is there Wi-Fi here? And if you know there's Wi-Fi because there's a sign, you can ask them, what's the Wi-Fi password? Now, sometimes the Wi-Fi passwords are just random letters or numbers and maybe you, you didn't hear it, you couldn't understand it. You can just give them your phone. Can you put it in for me, please? Can you write it down, please? Can you repeat that slowly, please? Now let's talk about getting around. So how you move from one location to another. You don't really need to know how to ask for directions anymore because your phone has GPS and will tell you exactly where to go. But let me share some common phrases with you. Excuse me, do you know how to get to the Empire State Building? Excuse me, which way is Central Park? Excuse me, does this train go to Central Park? Excuse me, which train will take me to Central Park? And notice I used excuse me for all of them because that is the most common standard in North America to get someone's attention. You could also say, excuse me, do you mind taking our photo? Because that is the one thing that people still ask other people for. Not directions anymore, but excuse me, do you mind? Do you mind taking, with that ING, do you mind taking our photo? Excuse me, could you please take our picture? So you can say photo or picture interchangeably. And as a final tip, before you pack your bags and head to North America, just remember that North America is incredibly diverse and we interact with non-native English speakers every single day, every time we leave the house. We go to stores, restaurants, our work environments, our social environments. We interact with non-native English speakers. North Americans in general are friendly, open, and accepting. So don't feel any bit of nervousness or shyness because you have an accent or make grammar mistakes. It will not impact your experience as a tourist. But of course, you do need to be able to communicate in a way that a native speaker understands. And all of these phrases will help you do just that. You might be preparing for a language exam like the IELTS. So now let me share 30 advanced phrases that you can use in your IELTS or in any formal situation. Of course, on the IELTS, they're going to ask you, where do you live? You can say, I was born and raised in Winnipeg. That's where I was born and raised. Did you know that? I was born and raised. To be born and raised in. Now here your verb is to be, so of course you need to conjugate it in the past simple because it's a completed past action. I was born and raised in and then you can state your city or your country. Now don't worry about taking notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. You can look in the description for the link. You can add on to this to make it sound more complex, to make you sound more advanced. I was born and raised in Winnipeg, but now, but now I live in Ottawa. Go even further and say, I've lived here for over 10 years. Now notice I used the present perfect 
You can also use the present perfect continuous only for the verbs live, work, and study. And this is for an action that started in the past and continues until now. So in the present perfect continuous, I've been living here for over 10 years. You can use four plus the specific number of years. You can even say four years several years, many years, a number of years. All of those are possibilities. Now let's move on to tell me about your work. You can say, I'm an engineer. I know this is a very simple sentence, but most students get it wrong because they forget the article. You must use an article before your job title. Most likely you're going to use a or an, but it is possible to use the article the. This is when there is only one position in the organization and you have that one position. For example, I'm the executive director. So there's only one executive director and that's me. Now, if we use the, it's more common to explain what the organization is or what the company is. But if you include just your job title with a or an, you can, but it, you don't need to. But if you use the, make sure you state your organization. Now add to this and add a general statement about your specific job. Being an engineer is rewarding. Notice here, being starts the sentence because it's a gerund statement. Gerund statements will absolutely make you sound more advanced. You could say, I love using my analytical skills to solve complex problems. Love is a verb of preference, so you need the verb of preference plus a gerund, love using. You could say, I enjoy collaborating with my team. Enjoy is a verb of preference, so you need the gerund. I enjoy collaborating with my team and brainstorming unique solutions to complex problems. So sure, you could say brainstorming solutions to problems, but adding adjectives makes you sound more advanced. You just mentioned something positive about your work. Why not make a contrasting statement and start with however? This is a transition word that we use to make a contrast and using transition words will make you sound so advanced. However, being an engineer also has its challenges. So before we had positives about being an engineer, However, and now a negative about being an engineer, a contrast. So now you can share one of those challenges, specifically another transition word to make you sound advanced. Specifically, I work around the clock to meet tight deadlines. To work around the clock is an expression and using expressions really shows you understand the language more at an advanced native level. And of course, to work around the clock, you can just imagine you work continuously, you work nonstop. Now let's talk about hobbies. You can begin with a gerund statement that expresses your opinion on hobbies. In my opinion, having hobbies is integral to living a fulfilling life. So our gerund statement is having hobbies is integral to, but then I just added on to that by expressing my opinion. So let's review some opinion words. Of course, in my opinion, in my view, from my perspective, notice here from, from my perspective, Personally, I think that. Have at least four different opinion words. You can use these four in your vocabulary when you go for your IELTS. Now let's get back to hobbies. You made your general statement, your gerund statement, beginning with an opinion word. Now you can state your specific hobby. I'm an avid hiker. Or maybe I'm an avid cyclist guitar player, tennis player, whatever your hobby is. So here the structure is to be 
an avid, and then you need a noun. And this means you have a strong interest, passion, or enthusiasm for that activity. Now you can make a gerund statement about why you enjoy this activity. Hiking gives me the opportunity to disconnect from my devices and enjoy the beauty of nature. Now notice that the gerund statement started with the verb hiking. You can also start a gerund statement with the noun. For example, guitar. Guitar gives me the opportunity to. You could say playing guitar, so you're using the verb form or the noun form with guitar. Both are correct. Now let's say you don't have any hobbies. Don't worry, you can still answer this question in a very advanced way. You can say, until now, my focus has been on my career. However, I'm considering taking up, and then an activity, taking up drawing. So notice we have our present perfect. My focus has been because the action started in the past and continues until now. Take up is the phrasal verb we use specifically with hobbies and activities to mean start. And notice consider plus gerund. I'm considering, that's in the present continuous, I'm considering taking up Take is in the gerund because consider plus gerund. You could also say, however, I'd love to take up drawing. The expression here is, I would love, and then infinitive. Perhaps it's simpler to remember and it still sounds advanced, so feel free to use this alternative. Now you can still add on a gerund statement about drawing, but use the future simple because you're not doing the activity right now. Drawing will give me the opportunity to disconnect. You could say, I'm confident that, or I'm hopeful that, drawing will give me the opportunity to disconnect. You will sound very advanced. Now let's move on to tell me about your family. You can say, I'm from a close-knit family. Close-knit. Notice that pronunciation, close-knit. This is an adjective that describes the family. Now, this is the same as saying, my family and I are very close. My family and I. This is the subject we. My family and I are very close. You can say everyone in my family gets along because everyone is conjugated as a singular. Everyone gets along really well or use extremely well to sound more advanced. Here's a great expression. Everyone says, I take after my mom in looks and I take after my dad in personality. When you take after someone, it means that you resemble them physically. So if you have a photo of you and your mom and people say, oh, I see the similarities. You take after your mom because your mom came first and maybe your mom takes after your grandmother, etc. But for personality, you can use this as well. So maybe your dad is very funny and you are very funny. So you take after your dad in personality. A great phrasal verb to use on the IELTS to sound very advanced. Now let's move on to talking about travel. You can say, I'd love, I would love, I'd love the opportunity to see Egypt, to travel to. Notice, travel to Egypt, but see Egypt, visit Egypt. So know when certain verbs require additional prepositions. Travel to a location, visit a location. If I could travel anywhere, I'd choose Egypt. This is our second conditional because it's hypothetical. And notice we have modal plus base verb. Don't use the infinitive, modal plus base verb. Of course, you can use a gerund statement. Visiting Egypt is at the top of my list. 
Imagine you have a list of places you want to visit and Egypt is at the top. You can make this more advanced by using the present perfect. Traveling to Egypt has been at the top of my list for as long as I can remember. An action that started in the past and continues until now. Now, why not use an opinion word? From my perspective, the pyramids are one of our world's greatest treasures. So you're sharing an opinion that reinforces why you want to visit Egypt. You can go on and say, and I'd revel in, I'd revel in the opportunity to see them with my own eyes. The expression is to revel in the opportunity and then your infinitive, to see them. This is a very advanced way of saying, I would thoroughly enjoy seeing the pyramids. Now as a bonus, let me share some phrases that you can use when you want to clarify your answer. So you're answering and you realize that the words aren't coming out very well. You can say, what I'm trying to say is, and then you can change your thought. You can express your thought a different way. What I mean is, what I'm getting at is, what I'm trying to get at is, to put it another way, in other words, and then you communicate your idea. I suggest memorizing four of these because they will be very helpful when you're taking your IELTS. Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers from TV, the movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English, expand your vocabulary with natural expressions, and learn advanced grammar easily. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for the link to learn more, or you can go to my website and click on Finally Fluent Academy. Now let's continue with our lesson. Are you ready to add 50 plus advanced expressions to your vocabulary that you can use when you're attending a job interview in English? Let's get started with the first question that you're going to be asked. Tell me about yourself. When you're asked this question, you absolutely must use the expression, I have more than, over, or almost, 10 years of experience, and then you can add as a, and your job title, as a project manager, as an accountant. Don't forget that article. It's very important that it's there before your job title. Now you can also talk about your experience in a particular field. I have almost 20 years of experience in the project management industry. I have more than 15 years of experience in the IT sector. So you can use field, industry, or sector. Now notice you have more than or over. That's when the number is greater than. And then you have almost. That's when the number is less than. So if you actually have 13 or 14 years of experience, well, it sounds better to use a round number, like 15. So you can say almost 15 years of experience if you have 13 or 14. Now, you can add to this and tell us more about your responsibilities in that role. So you can say, in this role, which is your role as a financial analyst, in this role, you could also say in that role, it doesn't matter, in this, that role, I was responsible for, or you can say I am responsible for, was if you're viewing the role as complete, and I am responsible for if you're currently doing that role. 
I was responsible for. Now, after this, we need a gerund verb. So you can use many, many different verbs to talk about your experience. These are the most common verbs you can use. In this role, I was responsible for managing, overseeing, leading, coordinating, creating, developing, reviewing, improving, streamlining, and analyzing. Of course, you can use other verbs, but these are the most common. Now, streamlining, this means improving the efficiency or effectiveness. So as a financial analyst, you could say, I have over 20 years of experience as a financial analyst in the IT industry. In this role, I'm responsible for overseeing a team of 15 people and I'm responsible for streamlining our operations. Now, in a job interview, you absolutely want to use more academic or formal adjectives. You don't want to say, I have a lot of experience. That doesn't sound very strong or convincing. It sounds a lot more impressive if you say, I have extensive experience. I have significant experience experience. So those are two must know adjectives that you should use in job interviews, extensive and significant, which simply is a more formal way of saying a lot of. I have significant experience. And again, after this, you need a gerund verb. You can use any of the verbs I've already shared. And of course, you'll have specific verbs for your industry and your specific job title. I have extensive experience creating international marketing campaigns for a variety of industries. Now, after this expression, I have significant extensive experience, you could also use a noun. I have significant project management experience. I have significant financial analysis experience. So you don't have to use a gerund verb, you could also use a noun. If you're asked about your education or your credentials, you can simply say, I have a bachelor of, I have a bachelor of science, a bachelor of arts, a bachelor of engineering, whatever that may be. Now you can end it there, but you may also choose to identify the school and the year you graduated. Those aren't requirements, but if you went to a prestigious or well-known school or you recently graduated, those might be useful details to include. I have a Bachelor of Science from Cornell. I graduated in 2020. You could also use the verbs received or obtained, which are more formal than have. However, it's extremely common to use the verb have. I have a bachelor, I have a master, but you can absolutely use received or obtained to use the more formal version. I received my master of education from Cornell in 2020. I obtained my master of engineering from MIT in 2019. If your credential is a certification, you can use the verbs, I received, I completed, or I obtained. I completed my PMP in 2019. Now notice here I use an acronym, PMP. If I'm applying for a job in the project management industry, they know what a PMP is. It's the most prestigious certification in the industry. It stands for Project Management Professional. So there's no need to identify an acronym if that acronym is well known in your specific industry. Let's talk about your personal strengths. The interviewer is likely going to ask you, what are your strengths? What would you say are your three best qualities? So here you can use a transition word, as for my strengths, as for my strengths, that's just to introduce the point, as for my strengths, I'm extremely, and then you can list the quality. 
Now notice here I use the adjective extremely. This is a more convincing adjective than I'm really or very. You want to avoid those common adjectives because they don't stand out and it's way more convincing to use a stronger adjective in a job interview like extremely. I'm extremely hardworking, which sounds stronger than I'm really hardworking. Let's review some common adjectives that you're going to use. And for all of these adjectives, you're going to use the verb to be and then list the adjective. I'm extremely hardworking, committed, trustworthy, honest, focused, methodical, proactive, a team player. For a team player, you can't use an adjective. You're simply going to say, I'm a team player. You're not going to say, I'm extremely team player. That doesn't work. I'm a team player. Now let's talk about some specific skills you should highlight in your interview. Now the following skills are rated as the top 10 skills that employers want. Of course the skills are specific to your industry, but you can take this as a general list of skills that would be useful to highlight during the interview. And to talk about these skills, you can say, I have, and for an adjective, you can say, I have advanced, I have superior, I have excellent, and then you list the skill. I have excellent time management skills. I have superior communication skills. I have advanced adaptability skills. The other top 10 skills are problem solving, teamwork, creativity, leadership, interpersonal skills, attention to detail, and work ethic. For work ethic, we have a very specific adjective and that's strong. I have a strong work ethic. So this is the specific expression for work ethic. I have a strong work ethic. So let's say you want to show off your communication skills. I have superior communication skills. Now let's say the interviewer wants to know why you're interested in this specific position. You could say, I'm looking for an opportunity to further or to develop my X skills. So your project management skills, your teamwork skills, your financial analysis skills, whatever the specific skill is. You could also say, I'm looking for an opportunity to gain experience in, and then you can talk about a specific field, industry, or sector in the IT industry, in the project management field, in the marketing sector. You should absolutely have a conclusion. Don't just say, Thank you for your time. You should leave them with a really strong impression of your skills and your ability to complete the job and be an asset to the organization. So you can say, I believe that, I know that, I'm confident that my extensive project management skills would make me a valuable asset to your company, your team, your organization. And I look forward to the opportunity to contribute to your goals. Of course, you should take this and adapt it to your specific industry or role, but you absolutely want a strong conclusion statement to impress the interviewer. So now you have 50 plus advanced English expressions that you can use to impress your interviewer. I want you to practice in the comments below by answering the question, tell me about yourself and try to use as many different expressions from this lesson as you can. I can't wait to learn a little bit more about your professional background. Let's keep going and you're going to learn 25 professional phrases that you can use anytime in the workplace. Our first phrase, I'm on board with that. This is used when you agree or you want to express your support for a suggestion or an idea. For example, we're on board, we are, the verb to be, we're on board with, that preposition with, 
We're on board with the new strategy for increasing sales. And don't forget to conjugate that verb to be with your subject and time reference. I'm on board. Next, are we on the same page? This is used to confirm that everyone has the same understanding, opinion, or viewpoint. After our discussion, it seems like we're on the same page. We all have the same opinion, understanding, or viewpoint. And to specify what that something is, you can say regarding, regarding the project timeline. Don't worry about taking notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. You can find the link in the description. Next, it's a win-win situation. This is a situation where all parties benefit, all parties win. I could say subscribing to j 4 English is a win-win situation. I win by growing my YouTube channel and you win by getting all of these free video lessons to help you become fluent. So put win-win, win-win, put win-win in the comments below. It's a win-win. Our next phrase, I could ask, what are your thoughts on this? This is used to request someone's opinion or feedback. You can identify something specific and say, what are your thoughts on the new marketing strategy? Remember, you can replace the noun, the new marketing strategy with this if it's obvious. Next, we need to think outside the box. Have you heard this one? To think outside the box. This is to encourage creative thinking, innovative thinking. If you're trying to solve a difficult problem, you might say thinking outside the box is the only way we'll solve this problem. You need innovative, creative solutions. All right, everybody start thinking outside the box. Next, I love this one. Let's circle back to that later. When you circle back to something, it means you stop discussing it now and you suggest that you discuss it later. So you postpone your discussion until later. You could say, we only have 10 minutes left, so let's circle back to this, whatever this is, your discussion about the marketing campaign, thinking outside the box, let's circle back to this later. Let's postpone it now and discuss it later. Notice the grammar. This is in the imperative. It's often the case because we use this as an instruction or a suggestion. Let's circle back to Dina. Our next phrase, we need to prioritize our tasks. If you prioritize something, it means you organize it based on importance and urgency. So the most important or the most urgent at the top of your list of to-dos because it's prioritized, it's the most important. This is a common situation. We don't have enough time to complete everything, so let's prioritize our tasks. I love this one. Please keep me in the loop. Do you know this one? Native speakers love using it. This is used to request that information or updates be shared as they happen. I could say, I'm taking tomorrow off, but please keep me in the loop on the project. Notice grammatically, this is the imperative because I'm giving you an instruction or a suggestion. You can add please at the beginning or the end of the imperative to sound more polite. Oh, good. Uh, keep me in the loop on that. Next, have they ironed out the details? This is used to ask if something has been resolved or clarified. For example, we need to iron out the contract details before the meeting. And notice that pronunciation in the past simple, ironed out, ironed out, ironed out. Phrase 10, I'm all ears. This is used to express your openness and willingness to listen. I could say, if you have any suggestions for improving this YouTube channel, I'm all ears. I'm open and willing to listen to your suggestions and that is 100% true. So please share your suggestions in the comments. Uh, I'm all ears. Next, let's take a step back. This is when you pause to review a situation or decision. 
our marketing campaign didn't work. Let's take a step back. Let's pause what we're doing working on the marketing campaign to review it, to make sure it is the right strategy. Let's take a step back. Notice this is also in the imperative for instructions or suggestions. This is a great one. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Use this when you disagree with someone's opinion or statement. Your coworker could say the marketing campaign didn't work because we didn't think outside the box. You could say, I beg to differ, which means I don't agree. I beg to differ. The campaign was great. It was our execution that failed. I beg to differ. Next, I'll cut to the chase. This is when you say your main point directly without small talk, without additional details. For example, I'll cut to the chase. You're not getting the promotion. Notice grammatically the expression is in the future simple. I will cut to the chase. I'll cut to the chase. Even though the information you're delivering is now I'll cut to the chase. You're not getting the promotion. This is a great one. Run it by the team first. This is when you share ideas for feedback and approval. I think it's a great idea, but you should run it by Frank first. You should share it with Frank to get his feedback and approval. And why should you do that? Because our next phrase, Frank calls the shots. This is to say that someone is in charge. They have the authority to make decisions. You should run your idea by Frank because he calls the shots. Notice it's the shots. It's always plural. I call the shots. Our next phrase, the balls in Frank's court. This is used to say is someone else's responsibility to make a decision. In this case, Frank, maybe you're talking to your coworkers and someone asks you, should we hire Jennifer as our English teacher? And you don't want to make that decision. So you can say the balls in your court to give responsibility for that decision to someone else. Remember to conjugate the verb to be because it's the ball is the balls. The ball is in your court. The balls in your court. <laughs> Next, we need to nip this in the bud. This is an important one because it's when you stop a problem at the early stages before it becomes permanent or more serious. Let's say you have a new policy for a dress code but none of the new employees are following the dress code. So that's the problem and you want to stop it in the early stages. You want to nip it in the bud. Grammatically, the verb is nip and to conjugate it, it's nip, nipped, nipped. You need to nip this in the bud. This is a great one. It's not my cup of tea. Do you know this one? This is used to say that you dislike something. Public speaking is not my cup of tea, but it's essential for my career. And remember there are two correct contractions. It isn't, it's not. You can use either one. They hammered out the agreement. This is used to say that something is finalized. As a question, have you hammered out the terms yet? This is commonly used with agreements, proposals, and contracts. Phrase 20, we're swamped right now. Dr. Kepner, um, we're swamped. This is to say you're really busy. We've been swamped since Vanessa quit. The expression is to be swamped. So your verb is to be, and then swamped is always in the ED form. Next, we'll take that into consideration. This is to say you'll consider something. You'll consider someone's feedback, suggestion, advice, recommendation. Now, because I'm all ears, you shared a suggestion with me. You said, Jennifer, I think you should upload videos three times per day. I could say, thanks for your suggestion. I'll take that into consideration. Next, we need to think long-term. This is used to emphasize the importance of considering future implications and considerations. I could say publishing videos three times per day would help my students. 
but I need to think long term. Is that sustainable for me? I'll become very swamped very quickly. Next, sorry, I'm tied up. This means you're busy and therefore unavailable. You could say, I wish I could help you, but I'm tied up. I'm already busy with something else and therefore unavailable. Now you can specify the something and use the preposition with. I'm tied up with the budget. Phrase 24, let's put our heads together. This is used to suggest the need for collaboration, brainstorming, or more than one opinion because the opinion is in your head and if you put heads together, then you have more than one opinion. If we put our heads together, I know we can nip this in the bud. And finally, phrase 25 to play devil's advocate. This is when you consider opposing viewpoints when making a decision. I could say, I think three videos per day is too much for me to handle, but let's play devil's advocate. So now I'm going to think about publishing three videos per day and think about what that would take, what my day would be like, just to see if it's possible and that will help me make my decision. Of course, it's very common to share your opinion in English. Now, instead of saying I think, let me share 40 different ways to say I think. First of all, there's nothing wrong with saying I think. I say it all the time, but I have many other expressions in my vocabulary that I use as well, and my choice depends on the situation I'm in. So let me share all the different alternatives that you need. First, let's talk about everyday situations. Let's take the statement, it's going to rain. Instead of I think, you can say, I'd say it's going to rain. I'd say. This is a contraction of I would, I would say, but native speakers use the contraction. I'd say it's going to rain. You can add to that and say, if you ask me, I'd say it's going to rain. They're exactly the same, it's just something nice we add on. I believe is going to rain. This is the closest alternative to I think, and it's very commonly used. It seems to me that the way I see it, to me, is going to rain. All three are used to really show your personal opinion. My close friend always says, I reckon. I reckon is going to rain. I personally don't say I reckon, but I really love when she says it. I prepared a free lesson PDF that summarizes all the expressions from this lesson, so you can find that in the description and in the comment section. Now you can also say it's going to rain and then add that's my take on it. This is a very common expression, my take on it Take is your assessment, how you see the situation. That's my take on it. So you first share your opinion or statement and then say, that's my take on it. You can do the same thing with the idiom, that's my two cents. Two cents, that represents opinion. Is going to rain, that's my two cents. Now let me share some more formal expressions that you would use in a job interview, a conference, a work meeting, or other formal situations. Let's say your opinion is we should revise the report. Revise means make changes to. We should revise the report. Of course, you can say I think that we should revise the report. You could also say from my perspective. This is a very common one. It sounds quite advanced. From my perspective, we should revise the report. Of course, you can simply say in my opinion. In my opinion, we should revise the report. And that does sound more formal than saying I think. You could say it's my view 
that we should revise the report, or it appears to me that we should revise the report. Keep in mind the word that is optional. We generally use it in written English and we generally exclude it in spoken English, but that's not a rule. So you could say, it appears to me we should revise the report, or it appears to me that we should revise the report. Both of these are correct. Let's talk about some expressions that express certainty. Certainty, 100%. So let's take our statement, we should promote John, lucky John. Now if you're 100% certain, you could say, I'm sure, I'm certain, I'm positive we should promote John. You could say it's obvious that we should promote John. You could replace obvious with indisputable, which means nobody could dispute it. It's indisputable that we should promote John. That sounds very firm. I like that one, indisputable. It's undeniable, it's unquestionable, it's beyond a doubt we should promote John. John must be really awesome. Now let's say that you do want to express some uncertainty or some doubt. So it could happen, but maybe it won't happen. You could say, it's possible that she's going to get the promotion. Instead of possible, you could say it's probable or it's likely she's going to get the promotion. I figure or I gather that she's going to get the promotion. One I really like is I have a hunch. I have a hunch that she's going to get the promotion. When you have a hunch, it's more based on your intuition rather than external evidence. I have a hunch that she's going to get a promotion. I just have this really good feeling. You could say, correct me if I'm wrong, but she's going to get the promotion. But if you say, correct me if I'm wrong, you're admitting that you may be wrong. You could also say, if I'm not mistaken, she's going to get the promotion. Again, there's some doubt there because you could be mistaken. You could say, to the best of my knowledge. To the best of my knowledge, she's going to get the promotion. Let's talk about some expressions that sound more diplomatic. So diplomatic because you might be introducing an opinion that people don't agree with or that is the opposite of what most people think. So maybe all your coworkers think that John should get the promotion, but you don't. So our statement is, John isn't a good fit. He isn't a good fit. To be honest, in all honesty, John isn't a good fit. Now remember, this is something that a lot of people don't agree with. So you might want to say it with some regret. To be honest, in all honesty, John isn't a good fit. I'm sorry to say it, but John isn't a good fit. If you want to be more neutral, you could say, one could argue that John isn't a good fit. Everyone else is saying he is, so you want to be more neutral and talk about how he isn't. One could argue that, my impression is that John isn't a good fit. I saved my favorite for last to be diplomatic, and that's, I get what you're saying, but John isn't a good fit. Now in this case, get means understand. So if you want to be more casual, informal, use get. I get what you're saying, but John isn't a good fit. If you want to be more formal, you can say, I understand what you're saying, but 
John isn't a good fit. Let's move on and learn 30 ways that you can say, I'm sorry. First, let's talk about some casual expressions that you can use in everyday situations. Let's take the example of bumping into someone at the grocery store and you want to apologize. So instead of saying, I'm sorry, you can simply say, sorry. I know it's a subtle difference, but it will really help you sound more natural to just say, sorry, sorry. You can also add so or very in front of it. So sorry, very sorry. Or you could say, sorry about that. That being the mistake, bumping into the person at the grocery store. Sorry about that, so sorry about that. I'm so sorry about that. To help you remember all of these expressions, I created a free lesson PDF. You can look in the description or the comment section for the link to download the free lesson PDF. Another common thing is simply to make a sound effect like oops, oops, whoops, oh no, oh my. And then you don't even have to say anything else because usually it's your facial expression. Oops. Oh. Oopsie. Oopsie. <laughs> Oopsie. Yikes. <laughs> Whoops. Oops. A slightly more formal one, but that's still very casual, is to say, excuse me or pardon me. <gasps> excuse me, pardon me. Those are quite common as well. Let's say that your friend asks you to buy her a chocolate chip cookie, but you bought her an oatmeal cookie. So instead of saying, I'm sorry, you could say, my bad, my bad. This is extremely common in North America and it will really make you sound like an American English speaker. My bad, my bad. Keep in mind it is quite casual and it's used for smaller things you want to apologize for, like getting the wrong cookie. My bad. You could also say my fault, my fault or my mistake. My mistake, I got you the wrong cookie. My bad. Let's say you want to admit your mistake. For example, you told your friend the party started at eight o'clock, but it actually started at seven. You could say, I was wrong. So instead of saying, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong time, you could say, I was wrong. Of course, you can use any of our other expressions, my bad, but one to specifically admit your mistake is simply to say, I was wrong. Often we say sorry if we can't do something that someone wants us to do. So let's say your friend invited you to a party, but you can't attend. It would be very common to say, I'm sorry, I can't attend your party. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, you can say, unfortunately. So replace, I'm sorry with unfortunately. Unfortunately, I can't help you. Unfortunately, I can't attend your party. Unfortunately, I can't drive you to the airport. Now let's talk about some more professional expressions that you can use in the workplace or a more formal situation. Let's say you arrive to an important meeting 10 minutes late. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, you can say, my apologies. Now you can expand that and say, my apologies for being late. To make it stronger, you can add sincere. My sincere apologies for being late. To sound even more formal, you could say, please accept my apologies. Please accept my sincere apologies for being late. That sounds very formal. Let's say you made a mistake at work and you ordered 100 boxes, but you should have ordered 10 boxes. 
Now, in the casual example, we learned I was wrong to admit you made a mistake. In a professional context, I recommend I take full responsibility. This sounds very professional because the word responsibility sounds professional. I take full responsibility for ordering the wrong number of boxes. My sincere apologies. And I take full responsibility. You could also say, I understand I made a mistake. I'll fix it. Now, instead of understand, you could say, I know I made a mistake. I admit I made a mistake. I'll fix it. So notice you're not just admitting it. You're also offering a solution. I'll fix it. I'll call the supplier right now. I'll get this resolved. So offering a solution is a great addition to admitting a mistake. Let's say that you kept a client waiting on the phone for a long time. Now, instead of saying, I'm sorry for the wait, you can say, I appreciate your patience. So instead of talking about the negative, you talk about the positive, which is the fact that your client is patient. I appreciate your patience. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for holding. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your patience. Now let's say that your boss or coworker or your client offers you some constructive criticism. So they tell you about something that you're not doing very well. Maybe your last presentation wasn't very good and they give you some constructive criticism, some feedback. Instead of saying, I'm sorry my presentation wasn't good, you can say, thank you for bringing this to my attention, or thank you for letting me know. And then you can add a solution. I'll work on that. I'll improve that. Or you can even ask them, how can I improve? Can you give me some suggestions to improve? Thank you for bringing this to my attention. There's one common idiom that you can use to admit you made a mistake. So remember in the casual example, you can say, I was wrong. In the professional example, you can say, I take full responsibility. The idiom that you can use in any situation is, the buck stops with me. The buck stops with me. This simply means I was wrong or I take full responsibility. The buck stops with me. Native speakers love using idioms, so adding idioms to your speech will help you understand native speakers and sound like one too. So now you're going to learn 50 common idioms that native speakers use. A blessing in disguise. This is when something, a situation seems bad or unlucky at first, but it results in something positive at a later date. So let's say you get fired from your job. Obviously that seems bad, maybe even unlucky, but later on you get a job 10 times better. It pays better, you have a better boss, better coworkers, the location is better. Everything about this job is better. You can say, getting fired was a blessing in disguise. My new job is so much better. A dime a dozen. This is used to describe something that is common and not special. So you can say tech startups in Silicon Valley are a dime a dozen. They're very common, they're everywhere, and they're not very special. Everyone's a tech startup in Silicon Valley, a dime a dozen. To beat around the bush. This is when you avoid saying what you mean because it's uncomfortable or awkward. So let's say you want to end your romantic relationship with your partner. 
Your friend could tell you, "Don't beat around the bush. Be direct and tell that person you want to break up." Better late than never. So let's say you've been working with a company for ten years. And you finally got your first promotion after ten years, and you're telling your friend this, and you're a little annoyed because you've been there for ten years. But your friend could say, "Better late than never," to remind you that yes, it took ten years, but it's better than not having a promotion. Better late than never. To bite the bullet. I love this idiom. This is when you force yourself to do something difficult or unpleasant because it's necessary or inevitable. Inevitable means eventually you have to do it. So why not bite the bullet and do it now? For example, just bite the bullet and ask your boss for a promotion. Break a leg. This is a very common idiom that we use to say "good luck." Good luck. Break a leg. But we especially use this before someone gives a performance, most commonly a theatrical performance. But when you're going for a job interview, you are in a sense performing. Or when you're doing your speaking exam for your IELTS, you are performing. So before your speaking exam, your friend, your partner could say "break a leg," which means good luck. To call it a day. When you call it a day, it means you stop working for that day. Usually because time is up, or because you've done enough work for that day, and you're going to stop. For example, it's getting late. Let's call it a day. Let's call it a day. So that means you can go home. To cut somebody some slack. So let's say there's this coworker who has been showing up late to work every day and not doing a very good job at work. They seem very distracted. They're not working very hard. They're not contributing. But that person's dad just died. So you might say, "Let's cut him some slack." His dad just died, so you're not going to punish him as severely as you normally would. To be glad to see the back of. This means that you're happy that somebody has left because you don't like them. So let's say it's Jane's last day at work. She quit. She has a new job, but you didn't like Jane. You can say. I'm glad to see the back of Jane. To be the best thing since sliced bread. This is a compliment used to say that something, usually technology or an invention, is extremely useful, excellent, or high quality. So you could give me a compliment and say this YouTube channel is the best thing. Since sliced bread. If you think that's true, then put it in the comments. There are plenty of fish in the sea. So let's say your friend went on a date, and she says Pierre hasn't called me back, and it's been three weeks. You can encourage your friend by saying, "Don't worry, there are plenty of fish in the sea. Come rain or shine." This is used to say that an event will take place despite external circumstances. So let's say tomorrow is a vacation day for you, but there's a big project deadline tomorrow. But you might say, "I'm taking the day off tomorrow. Come rain or shine, to cut corners." This is when you do something in the cheapest, easiest, or fastest way, but by omitting something or by not following rules. 
So you might say, we felt pressured to cut corners because of the tight deadline. To get your act together. So your parents might say to you or your sibling or someone you know, you're 30 and you still live at home and you don't have a job. You need to get your act together. You need to organize yourself so you can live in, a, in an effective and efficient way. Get your act together to break the ice. This is such an important one because this is used to help people who don't know each other to feel more comfortable around each other, especially when they're meeting for the first time. Let's break the ice by introducing ourselves and sharing something interesting about ourselves. Clear as mud. This is used to say that something is very difficult to understand. So if somebody gave you instructions, but their instructions didn't make any sense at all, and they ask you, so is everything okay? Do you understand? You can say clear as mud, which tells the person you do not understand at all. Crystal clear, something is very clear and easy to understand. His instructions were crystal clear. To rock the boat. This is when you do or say something that could upset people or cause problems. Don't rock the boat until the negotiations are done. So don't say anything that could upset someone or that could cause problems until we sign the deal. And then you can cause problems if you want to. To get out of hand, this is another way of saying to get out of control, which means you no longer have control over a situation. You could say the party got out of hand, which means you were no longer able to control it. The party got out of hand and some valuables were broken. A bad apple. This is used to describe a bad or corrupt person within a group. You could say, there are a few bad apples in the company. To cut to the chase. This is when you only talk about the most important points of a subject or topic. So if you're running out of time in, the, in a meeting, you might say, we're running out of time, so I'll cut to the chase. I'll only say the most important points. To come in handy. This is used when something is very useful for a specific purpose. So if it's pouring rain outside, you might say an umbrella would come in handy. An umbrella would be very useful in this particular situation. To reinvent the wheel. This is when you waste time trying to recreate something that somebody else has already created. So let's say you ask your boss, should I create a presentation for the conference? And your boss suggests using last year's presentation. It's already created. And your boss can add, don't reinvent the wheel. So we often use this idiom in the negative. To go with the flow. When you go with the flow, it means that you do what other people are doing or you agree with the opinion of others, the majority. So let's say you're having a company dinner and you originally wanted to have burgers, but the majority of people say they want pizza. So you can go with the flow and have pizza instead of burgers because that's what the majority wants. To be skating on thin ice. This is when you do something that is dangerous or involves risk. He's skating on thin ice by lying to his wife. It involves risk. It's dangerous. Don't do it. A silver lining. This is something positive that comes from something negative. 
So the pandemic is negative, right? But is there anything positive, a silver lining? Maybe we could say one silver lining of the pandemic is that it made us realize how important our relationships are with friends and family. To have a sweet tooth. This is somebody who likes eating sweet foods, especially chocolate. So if people offer me dessert, generally I'll say no because I don't like sweet food. So I could say, no, thank you. I don't have a sweet tooth, which means I don't really like sweet foods. To go Dutch. This is when you agree to share the cost of something, especially a meal. So let's say you're having dinner with a friend, family member, even a romantic partner, and they say, I'll pay for the meal. You could say, no, 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 let's go Dutch, which means you're going to divide the cost 50-50. To make ends meet. This is when you have just enough money to pay for essential items. You might say, with food prices increasing, we're barely making ends meet. To ring a bell. This is when something, usually a person, a place, or information is familiar to you. So let's say you're having a conversation with a coworker and they say, oh, have you met Fred from accounting? And you're thinking, Fred, Fred, Fred from accounting? That doesn't ring a bell. The tip of the iceberg. This is used to describe a small part of a much bigger problem. These small local protests are just the tip of the iceberg to blow off steam. This is when you say or do something that helps you release strong feelings or strong energy, strong emotion. After our fight, I went for a walk to blow off steam. So when you were on that walk, you were able to calm down, to release that negative energy. A piece of cake. This is something that was extremely easy. That exam was a piece of cake. To be out of the woods. This is when you no longer have a problem or difficulty. Our profits are increasing, but we're not out of the woods yet. To get over something. This is when you recover from an illness. It took me two weeks to get over that cold. To not be one's cup of tea. This is used to describe a type or category that you don't like. Thanks for the invite, but camping isn't my cup of tea. I don't like that category of activity. To be loaded. This means to be rich, to have a lot of money. I just found out my cousin's loaded. To nip something in the bud. This is to stop something before it has an opportunity to become established. We need to nip these rumors in the bud before the employees start worrying. Out of the blue. When something happens out of the blue, it happens suddenly and you weren't expecting it. My boss gave me a promotion out of the blue. You weren't expecting it. How awesome is that? To keep one's chin up. This is to remain cheerful in a difficult situation because in difficult situations, we tend to put our chin down, but when we're happy, we tend to keep our chin up. For example, I know the economy seems bad, but keep your chin up. To race against the clock. This is when you try to finish a task quickly before a specific time. I raced against the clock to finish the audit and meet the deadline. To catch somebody off guard. This is when you surprise somebody by doing something they weren't expecting or weren't prepared for. The politician was caught off guard when asked about the scandal. 
To be on one's radar. If something is on your radar, it means you're considering it or thinking about it or aware of it. You could say leaving the company isn't on my radar. It's not even something I'm considering. To stab someone in the back. This is to betray someone, to do something harmful to someone who trusted you. She told the client she did all the work on the project. I can't believe she stabbed me in the back like that. To make a beeline for something. This is when you move quickly and directly towards something. So let's say you're at a wedding or a conference and they're about to serve lunch, the buffet lunch. Everyone made a beeline for the food. They went quickly and directly to the food. To be in hot water. This is when you're in a situation where you might be criticized or punished. The politician's in hot water after his comments on gender equality. To be dressed to the nines. This is when you're dressed formally, smartly, or fashionably. We dress to the nines for our wedding anniversary. So you usually dress to the nines for a special occasion. To be between a rock and a hard place. This is when you're in a difficult situation or you have to make a difficult decision. If I accept the promotion, then I'll have to move abroad and I know Matt, my partner, won't come with me. So I either accept the promotion that I really want, but then I have to lose Matt, or I stay with Matt and I don't get the promotion. Hmm. I'm between a rock and a hard place. It's a difficult situation. It's a difficult decision. Lo and behold, this is an expression used to say that something surprising happened. I was on vacation in Japan and lo and behold, I saw my childhood sweetheart. So it's very surprising that I see my childhood sweetheart across the world in a foreign city, lo and behold. And finally, number 50, to let the cat out of the bag. This is when you accidentally reveal a secret. So let's say you're planning a surprise party for your wife or husband or friend and they know about it. You might say, you know about the party, don't you? Who let the cat out of the bag? Who told you? Who revealed the secret? Who let the cat out of the bag? Now you're going to learn 24 colloquial words that you can use every day. To sound more fluent and natural, to understand native speakers, you need to know colloquial English, also known as colloquialisms, simply casual speech. And today you're going to learn 24 colloquial words that you need to know. Welcome back to J4's English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. Colloquial English, also known as colloquialisms, is simply informal language used in everyday speech. This includes phrases, idioms, and expressions, and you can use these with your friends, your family, and even your colleagues and boss. As a warning, just know that these may or may not be appropriate for more formal situations. It depends on the specific situation. How does this compare to slang? Well, slang is very informal speech that is often not standard English. And slang is often viewed as unprofessional. Colloquial English, what you'll learn today, is casual but friendly and natural. And I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF, so don't worry about taking notes. Number one, let's hit the books. Do you know this one? You should because to hit the books means to begin studying. You could say, I have a big test tomorrow, so I need to hit the books. And hopefully you're going to hit the books by watching more of my videos to help you improve your English. If you agree, put let's do it, let's do it, let's do it in the comments below. 
Hit the box. Well, time to hit the box. And number two is let's do it. To do something, this is a casual, friendly way of saying to complete something. But native speakers use this in many different situations. I could ask you, are you ready to leave? And then you say, yes, I'm ready. So I say, let's do it, which means let's leave. Let's complete that action. Let's do it. So let's practice this. Do you want me to teach you the next expression? If you do, again, put let's do it, let's do it, put let's do it in the comments. Let's do it, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Number three, yup or yuppers. Have you ever heard yuppers? Oh, this is a great one. Again, I can ask you, are you ready to leave? And you can say, yes, I'm ready to leave. Or instead of yes, to sound more casual, you can say yup or yuppers. You can put it in a full sentence, yup, I'm ready, yuppers, I'm ready, or you can just use that one word, yup, yuppers. And notice that S, yuppers, with an S. So again, question for you, do you want me to keep teaching you natural expressions? Put yuppers with that S, put yuppers in the comments if you do. Yuppers. Yappers. Yep, 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 yep. Number four, I'll see you at eight ish. Hmm, what time is eight ish? Do you know? Adding ish to the time means around, around eight. So this could be 745 or 815. To sound more professional, you can say, I'll see you at approximately eight. That's the more formal way to say around. And the casual way is to add ish. Native speakers use this a lot. We'll be there soon. Well, soonish. This means in the near future, but not immediately. It's a little longer than soon. Just know that ish is not actually a word, but all native speakers understand it. Oh, so we say, oh, uh, what? Number five, my bad. You know this one, right? This is used when you take responsibility or accept fault. Maybe you're in a meeting and your colleague says, the chart on page five is from 2023. Shouldn't it be from 2024? My bad, I'll change that ASAP. No worries. My bad, Missy, my bad. My bad. I'm bad. Our next one is, of course, no worries. You probably know this one. This means it's okay or don't worry about it. Native speakers often use this instead of you're welcome. Jennifer, thanks so much for the new lesson. You might say that. And I can reply to you and say, no worries, no worries. But we also use this to apologize. Maybe you're shopping and you accidentally hit someone with your shopping cart and you can say, oh, I'm so sorry. And the person replies back and says, no worries. No worries. No worries. No worries. No worries. Everything's all no worries. No worries. Number seven, no big deal or no biggie. This also means it's okay, don't worry about it, no worries, or it's not significant, it's not important. So again, if you're shopping and you accidentally hit someone with your shopping cart and you say, oh, I'm so sorry, the person can reply back and say, no big deal. This is often used after an expression of gratitude to say, it wasn't significant, it wasn't important. Maybe you say, wow, Jennifer, it's so nice of you to provide a free lesson PDF. Remember, you can download it in the description. And I can reply back and say, no big deal, no biggie. I'm letting you know that this wasn't a significant task for me to do, so I'm happy to do it. All right, no big deal, no big deal. No biggie. No big deal. Number eight, a hundred percent. This one is very trendy right now. She doesn't do her fair share of the work, a hundred percent. This means I completely agree with you. I 100% agree with you. 
For pronunciation, native speakers often say a uh, a hundred percent, a hundred, a hundred percent. You can also say one hundred percent. Yeah, agree, hundred percent. Absolutely agree, hundred percent. Number nine, I'm really into yoga. What about you? What are you into? To be into something, this is when you enjoy doing something. You have a strong interest in something. This question is commonly used when you're getting to know someone. So if you're on a first date, you can ask the person, so what are you into? And he replies back and says, I love rebuilding cars. It's my passion. Just notice a verb, a preference, love, is commonly used to reply to this question. So what about you? What are you into? You could say, I'm really into learning English with J Forest English. Oh, thanks so much. Notice that structure. Verb to be, I am into, and then you have your verb with ing, learning English. If that describes you, again, put let's do it, let's keep learning, let's do it, put let's do it in the comments. And right now, I'm into yoga. I'm really into fashion. Number 10, let's Uber it. What does this mean? This means let's take an Uber. Native speakers frequently turn nouns, Uber, into a verb. A native speaker would commonly say, I'll email you, I'll WhatsApp you, I'll Zoom you, using them as verbs. Remember, you have to conjugate the verb with the subject in time reference. Last night, we Ubered to the conference. Last night, we took an Uber to the conference. I'll email you the address. Number 11, that's wild. This is used to show surprise, amazement, or astonishment. A lot of Ubers won't accept my ride because I live outside of the city. This is true. You can reply back and say, that's wild, which means I'm surprised. That's wild. <laughs> that's wild. Number 12, really? With a question, really? This is also used to show surprise, amazement, or astonishment. I don't get Uber Eats. It won't come to my area. Also true. You can reply and say, really? And you can even add, that's wild. Put them both together. Really? Really, really. Number 13, shoot. This means ask your question. Jennifer, I have a question about number 11. Shoot. Ask me your question. Jennifer, can I ask you a question about number five? Shoot, yes, you can ask me your question. Number 14, give me a shout. First notice in the last one, shoot, pronunciation, oot. This one, out, shout, shoot, shout. This means call me or contact me. Give me a shout when you land. Give me a shout at eight-ish. Give him a shout. Give him a shout. If he pops out, give me a shout. Number 15, can you flip me the invite? To flip means to send electronically. You flip someone something, just like you send someone something. Can you flip the team, someone, the invite, something. You can also flip something to someone. Same with send something to someone. Can you flip the invite something to the team, someone? Number 16, now let's look at the invite. Can you flip me the invite? Invite is a shortened form of invitation. To invite is a verb. She invited the team to the party. An invitation is a noun. Have you sent out the invitations for the party? An invite is a noun. Have you sent out the invites for the party? Notice, because it's a noun, it has a singular or plural form. I have to send you an invite. I can send you an invite if you want. Number 17, I'll flip it to you in a sec. In a sec means in a second, which is a short period of time, soon. You can say, I'll be there in a sec. You can also get someone's attention by saying, do you have a sec? Do you have a small amount of time? Maybe a few minutes in this case. And I can reply back and say, yep, yuppers. There in a sec. Wait, you in a sec. Oh, wait a sec. Number 18, she's a newbie. 
A newbie is a new member of a team or a group. You might say, can you show Sarah how to file the reports? She's a newbie. Or your boss might say, keep an eye on the newbies while I'm gone. What about you? Are you a new member of this community? Have you recently subscribed or started watching my videos? If you have, then put, I'm a newbie, I'm a newbie. Put, I'm a newbie in the comments. I love newbies. I'm happy to have you. She's a total newbie. I'm a newbie. Sure, newbie. Number 19, my study routine is dialed in. To be dialed in means to be fully optimized or perfected. And here, dialed in functions as an adjective. So is your study routine fully optimized, perfected? If it is, you can say, it's my study routine. It's dialed in. If not, you can say, I need to dial it in. In this case, it's the verb. I need to dial it in. I need to perfect it, optimize it. How dialed in were you? Number 20, I'm crushing it. To crush something means to do a great job. So if you're enjoying this video, you can say, Jennifer, you're crushing it. You're doing a great job. Do you agree? If you do, put crushing it, crushing it, crushing it in the comments. This is a verb. So in the past simple, you would say, I crushed the job interview. I did a great job. I'm crushing it. Yeah, I'm really crushing it. Exactly. See? I'm crushing it. Number 21, I'm loving it. You probably recognize this because of McDonald's. McDonald's slogan is I'm loving it. And notice loving in loving it. Now, this technically breaks an English grammar rule because love is a state of verb. So you would say, I love this song, even if the action takes place right now. But McDonald's popularized this, so now it's very friendly, casual, and acceptable to say, I'm loving this song. And by putting it in the present continuous, it emphasizes that the action is taking place now. I love it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> Number 22, learning English is a piece of cake. You know this one, right? To be a piece of cake means to be very easy. Maybe learning English is a piece of cake when you have a great teacher. If you agree, you can say 100%. So put that in the comments. Uh, it's a piece of cake, piece of cake. It's a piece of cake. It's a piece of cake. Number 23, we shot the breeze in the elevator. To shoot the breeze, this is to make small talk. So to have casual, lighthearted conversation. Notice those conjugations, shoot, but in the past, shot, and the past participle, shot. You might say, my neighbor and I always shoot the breeze when we take out the garbage, we see each other and we have a lighthearted conversation. We shoot the breeze. And finally, number 24, you're on fire. To be on fire, this means to perform well, to do a great job. I could say, you just added 24 common and natural expressions to your speech. You're on fire. So let's celebrate this. Put, I'm on fire, I'm on fire. You just did an amazing job. Put, I'm on fire in the comments. Amazing job, now you have 300 words that you can use in your daily speech. Do you want me to make another lesson just like this? If you do, put masterclass, masterclass, put masterclass in the comments below. And of course, make sure you like this lesson, share it with your friends, and subscribe so you're notified every time I post a new lesson. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And you can keep expanding your vocabulary with 300 more words in this lesson right now.